There are a few things more unnerving than chasing a speeding vehicle on the highway. But when those being pursued are also escaped convicts and armed, the risks go up substantially. However, Colorado State Trooper James Harper took that risk without a moment's hesitation. That's up against the wall. Early on a March morning inside the Sierra Amarillo Jail, inmates Larry Anthony and Faustin Martinez are in no mood for breakfast. What they're in the mood for is a fast break. Anthony takes his trade, and as Martinez goes for his, he gives his partner a signal. The time to move is now. But as they rush out of the jail, they're spotted, and immediately an all-points bulletin is sent throughout the area. Once outside, the escapees find the jailer's white pickup truck and dash into it, wanting to put as much distance as possible between themselves and the jail. At 7.30, the fugitives pass Colorado State Trooper James Harper on Route 285. Harper recognizes the vehicle from the APB. The report on the two men indicates that they should be considered dangerous. Trooper Harper soon finds that to be true. As he closes in on the truck, the man in the passenger seat grabs a gun and leans out the window aiming directly at Harper. To avoid being shot, Harper swerves across the road and slows down. This tactic works as the gunman drops back into the truck. But as soon as Harper tries to move in again, the same thing happens. Only this time, the truck breaks suddenly, nearly causing Harper to ram it. The chase continues at high speed. Harper manages to stay with the truck until it makes a sharp turn, taking him by surprise. Trying to make the turn, he winds up caught in the soft dirt on the shoulder of the highway. It takes him a few moments to get back into the chase. As Harper races to catch up to the pickup, the fugitives are in trouble. The truck is beginning to overheat. They decide to turn off the main road, hoping to lose the highway patrolman in the back country. Finally, the truck quits on them, and the two men run into the brush, with Martinez carrying the rifle. But Harper is close behind and sees the truck stopped up ahead. He pulls up nearby, and grabbing his own weapon, a standard-issue 12-gauge shotgun, he takes cover behind his vehicle and tries to get the two men to surrender. Throw out your guns and come But the out. men aren't about to go back to jail, especially Martinez. Popping out of the brush, he points his rifle at the state trooper and then just as quickly ducks back down again. Harper orders the man to drop the rifle and surrender. The fugitive's response is to threaten Harper for a second time. Again, the patrolman demands that the gunman give up. Martinez rises up a third time, raising his rifle. At this point, fearing that he is going to be shot, Harper raises his own weapon and fires once, knocking Martinez to the ground. Put your hands over your head and come out! Don't shoot! I don't have a gun! Come on out! Don't shoot! Walk over here! Put your hands over your head! Don't and shoot. behind your head! Put your hands behind your head! Anthony gives up without resistance. The drama is over with one fugitive in custody and the situation secured. Trooper Harper now waits for backup. Turn around. Turn around. Walk backwards. Faustin Martinez died at the scene. His partner, Larry Anthony, was charged with assault on a peace officer and served four and a half years in a Colorado penitentiary. Past midnight on a quiet autumn night in Little Rock, Arkansas, a woman on her way home from a long day's work stops by a supermarket to pick up a few groceries. Well, look what we have here. Let's do it. As she reaches her car and fumbles with opening the door, a pair of thugs take advantage of the opportunity. Hey, lady. Got any money? No, there's no money. In. No, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Threatening her at gunpoint, they rip her purse away and savagely beat her to the ground. Okay, 
30 minutes later, Arkansas State Troopers John Sparks and Joe Bill Young pick up on a police broadcast to be on the lookout for the suspect's car. They spot a vehicle matching that description and call in for verification. Uh, it was a uh, late model uh, Chevrolet red color with uh, two black males. Looks like this is them, Joe Bill. Yeah. Wood starting at the end of the area. We're going to stop. The suspects, noticing the patrol car behind them, pull into a car wash, hoping the troopers will pass them by. However, the troopers interpret the turn into the car wash as an evasive move and signal the suspect's car to pull over. The suspects flee. In a chase that reaches speeds over 100 miles per hour, the troopers try to force the suspect's car to stop. But each time they attempt to pull alongside, the suspects swerve threatening a high-speed collision. At first, Trooper Young tries to gain control of the suspects by establishing contact and demanding that they stop. When that fails, the troopers opt for a more drastic method. Trooper Sparks pulls the patrol car just behind and to the left of the suspects, giving Trooper Young a clear shot at the vehicle's left rear tire. Trooper Young fires four shots, and the suspect's left rear tire goes flat, forcing the car off the road and into a field of weeds. Hey, please stop or I'll shoot. Put your hands on your head and interlace your fingers. Both suspects run from the car immediately. The driver is stopped within seconds by Trooper Sparks and is taken into custody. The passenger, a little more fleet of foot, makes it into the woods before Trooper Young catches up with him. Questioned about the pile of purses and wallets found in the back seat of his car, the driver admits that he and his partner had assaulted nine people over the course of the day. He also reveals his partner's name and address. The troopers turn their prisoner over to the Little Rock police and sit out to find his partner. The suspect's mother answers the door. Well, he's in bed. He's been in bed all day. You mind if we check? Okay, sure. Further evidence of the suspect's complicity in the supermarket assault are his wallet and identification found in the passenger seat of the getaway car. Although his mother claims he's in bed and asleep, as most people are at 2 o'clock in the morning, she allows to show troopers to her son's room. They are convinced they have the right man. Well, I can't believe this. Dang. Robbery has an armed robbery. Dang. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, Ken, will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to an attorney. For his role in the day-long armed robbery spree, the passenger is sentenced to 10 years in prison. His partner, the driver, receives 12 years. Sometimes pursuits continue from one state into another. As soon as a suspect crosses that state line, the pursuit becomes the next state's responsibility. That's the situation faced by the Wyoming Highway Patrol near the Utah border. On a cold, crisp August morning on the flatlands of Utah, a state patrolman clocks a black Mercedes going 99 miles an hour in the oncoming lane. Turning around, the patrolman follows the car, and when it refuses to pull over, the pursuit begins. The officer, continuing the chase for several miles, crosses the border into Wyoming. It's then that the Utah officer requests a roadblock from the Wyoming State Highway Patrol. Prolo, Charlie 12, I'm in pursuit of a black Mercedes, eastbound on Interstate 80, in excess of 100 miles an hour. Request that Wyoming set up a roadblock at milepost 31. Sam Roderick, the man being sought, has a history of minor traffic infractions. But this particular August day, he is incredibly despondent and wants to end it all. Troopers Lynn DeClerc and Jeff Barrett are using some downtime to catch up on the day's activities when they get the call. Charles 12 is requesting roadblock in Wyoming. 1069, myself and 124 will be in route. They decide to set up an S-shaped roadblock on Interstate 80. The suspect continues to evade the pursuing officers. Come on, what are you doing? Let's go. Come on, let's go. Get going. Officer, what's going on here? Nothing important. Let's come on, just move your car. Come on, get out of here and go. Get going. Get out of here. Here they come. Jeff, here they come. Car over 
here now. When he tries to get around the roadblock, he's forced over to the shoulder. The car stalls, and he takes off on foot. Halt! Get out of the car! Freeze! Halt! Put the gun down! Go run his face. Halt! Put the gun down! Go ahead and shoot I don't want to live! Shoot me! I don't want to die! Shoot me! Oh, God. Go! The troopers continuing to pursue the man are joined by a Uinta County Deputy Sheriff. Leave me alone! I want to die! They lose sight of the suspect, and they decide to wait for the sheriff to arrive before making their next move. We lost sight of him, Sheriff. He went over this ridge right over here. Don't know where he went from there. Is he still armed? Yeah, he still has his revolver. Oh. Oh. There he goes now. Okay, let's surround him. Cover. Okay, Sergeant, I'm going to take this side. The officer moves closer to the suspect as reinforcements arrive. A specially trained sharpshooter is brought in and is directed to a spot where he can overlook the suspect. Officer de Klerk decides to get close enough to try and reason with the man as the sharpshooter covers him. Put your gun down! Come on, just put it down. Uh, we can talk. I'm the suspect knows he's surrounded. The clerk distracts him long enough for the sheriff to move in from behind him. Hey, boys. Hey, hey, get here. Come on, get away from me. I'll shoot myself, I swear. Come on, we haven't got time to put up with this all day. Get away from me. Get it down. The sheriff's presence agitates the suspect even more. And wanting to cool things down, he backs off. All right, just don't do anything. Don't do anything. Put my gun down. Trooper the clerk moves closer and continues to talk to the crazed man. I'm not going to harm you. Just relax. We've been out here for two hours now. By this point, the suspect is nearly over the edge and appears anxious and self-destructive. It's really cold out here, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Okay. All right. I'm just going to sit down here with you, all right? Okay. Okay. What's your name? Sancho. It's very obvious you don't want to hurt any of us out here today. No, I want to die. When I walked up on him, I wasn't really fearful for my own life. And I know that may sound a little arrogant, but at the time, I never felt a threat. He, he basically uh, had the gun turned on himself, and maybe it was a little stupid, but I just felt that I could go up and maybe talk to him, and we, maybe we could just end the situation a little bit. He said that he wanted to talk to a priest and that uh, to find out if it really was a sin to commit suicide. The priest was able to, to give him that answer, and I think that answer was real important coming from someone of the religious faith, and hopefully he can answer those questions that you were asking me. All right? Okay. So, I don't want to die. No, I don't think you really do. Father, I had to talk to you. Does God consider it a sin to commit suicide? He did indicate to me that he did not want to live, that he wanted to die, and he wanted to die for reasons that, that I had no knowledge of. Um, he didn't really want to tell me a whole lot about his life at the time. Um, so I guess you do feel sorry for somebody like that because you, it's, it's, it's hard to feel compassion for someone that... You, you, you don't know why they're hurting. Had he, had he been able to talk to me a little bit more and, and tell me more as, as to why he wanted to die, 
maybe it would be easier to understand. Son, why don't you give the officer your gun? He gave me the, the gun just a, just a couple moments after the priest had arrived and talked with him. He basically, you know, asked him if it was a sin to commit suicide, and the priest went in and told him, yes, it was a sin, had him look around, and, and, and maybe made him realize what life was all about. When two neighbors got into a fight in Evanston, Wyoming, the local police requested backup. Highway Patrolman Jim Geating answered the call, not knowing he would be putting his own life on the line. On a sunny, warm afternoon in downtown Evanston, Wyoming, a bunch of locals are playing cards and drinking beer in an alley adjoining Bill Patterson's apartment, and he is starting to lose control. One of Bill's neighbors confronts the group and complains about the noise. You're the worst of all. You're my neighbor. Why do you let this happen to our alley? I call the cops. Get out of the alley, you punk. All right, go upstairs and turn your stereo off. You don't like the noise. Yeah, Jim Geating, how you doing? I've been talking to you for two years, and it's nice to find you. Officer Jim Geating of the Wyoming Highway Patrol drops by dispatch to match a face with the voice that so often speaks to him when he's out on patrol. This is our call taker station where we take information from the public and what we do is uh, type in the location which I already have 10 miles west of Evanston typed in here. Never far from an obligation to duty, another dispatcher relays a call for assistance. Alcohol and a flirtatious friend send the irate tenant over the edge. Well, you're just jealous. I'll call you whatever I want to call you. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. Come on, man. Evanston police arrive on the scene, but decide to wait for backup before going upstairs after Patterson. In Wyoming, unlike some other jurisdictions, the highway patrol is often called in to assist other agencies with everything from bar fights to homicides to domestic disturbances. And on this day, an out-of-control neighborhood dispute. What do you got? That guy's involved in a fight. He ran up the stairs here. He's up here now? Yeah, he had a knife with him. He's got a knife? Yeah. Okay, all right. Hey, bring her up for a minute. Come here, here. What do you know about this guy? He's a real jerk. Always causes trouble. Okay, all right. Is there another way into that room? No. You sure? Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Once Even though this dispute right technically falls under the jurisdiction of the city police, this particular afternoon, the Highway Patrol's cooperation is greatly appreciated. The sergeant approaches the apartment with caution and readiness, also confident he is covered from below. Please, open up. Please, I need to talk to you. What's going on, officer? He's always in trouble. Get back in your apartment now. He's got to be in there. Hearing the deadly sound of a shotgun chambering around, fearing for his life, the police officer bolts from the deck, spraining his ankle as he falls. The deadly stakes of a standoff now begins. If you got a shotgun in there, buddy, you better come out now. Get out of here, all of you. I'll kill anyone that comes near me. Nobody wants to bother you or hurt you. We just need to talk it over. Come on. I don't want to talk to anybody. See here? I'm not kidding, I can do it, I can kill y'all. As the afternoon passes, Officer Geating patiently waits for a potentially deadly altercation to diffuse itself. Come on out. Come on, let's go. Come on, I'm getting hungry, man. I'm sure you are too. Let's go. Come on out. You 
got the door open. Now come on out. Get back in the house now! One of the suspect's neighbors almost upsets the scene. What's your name anyway? My name's Jim. Oh, big tough trooper, huh? No, 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 I'm just a man, all right? I want to work with you on this. Okay, you want to come over the stairs? You want to come on down? I'll come down if somebody meets me halfway. You want somebody to meet you? I want somebody to meet me halfway. No, 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 you're laying your gun down. Nobody's coming up there unless you lay that thing down. Finally, Patterson sees Keating as a man behind the badge. Okay, right. Becoming worn out, he decides to find a way to get out of his no-win situation. Come on down. Hands up. Easy now. Laying up to the floor. So bring his arm back. Bring it back. Take it easy. Relax. I got you. You know, when I went into his apartment that day, I found a virtual arsenal. Handguns, knives, a couple more shotguns, survival magazines. He had a real problem. He never did go over the edge that day. He never did push me too far. But had he done so, he would have sealed his own fate. Okay, let's go. Okay, you don't push up I was glad to hear that after this happened, he had received medical treatment. And he's now out, leading a productive life and doing well. It's a cloudy autumn afternoon in Rapid City, South Dakota. And Tom Barnett is desperate for money. Like a predator staking his prey, he moves in towards the automatic teller machine. His victim uses her card to access the ATM. Barnett quickly follows her inside. Just got off work. Barnett's actions make her so nervous, she enters the wrong code numbers in the machine. Barnett senses her uneasiness. His prey is about to take flight. Don't move! There's gun, gun in your back. Don't scream. Be very quiet. The woman withdraws all the cash she can. the rest of it? Give me that. Okay, now you stand over there. Don't move. You stay right there. Don't move. Don't you dare move. Barnett tapes the door shut, trapping the petrified woman inside. Barnett stops at a small frame house on the outskirts of town to pick up his wife and young son. He plans to take them to Denver. Come on, Billy. The family heads south into Wyoming toward what they believe will be a new life for them. Home, 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 home. In Wyoming. Making me nervous. Please slow down. As the robbery suspect and his family drive south, Wyoming Highway Patrolman Rick Dye approaches from the opposite direction. He spots the Barnett car passing other traffic and quickly uses his radar to get a lock on its speed. There's a highway patrolman. I told you you needed to slow down. By the time Officer Dye crosses over to the south lane, Barnett is more than a half a mile ahead. The patrolman has to go 90 just to catch up with him. Dai signals the driver to pull over. See your driver's license, registration, and proof of insurance. Well, th this is my friend's car, officer. I don't have uh, the registration or proof of insurance. I I've got I've got my license with me, though. The driver hands Dye an Oregon driving permit instead of a driver's this license, using the yes, excuse sir. that he's been in the military and just it's returned car, from Germany. Sir. Officer Dye returns to his patrol car to issue the driver a traffic citation for speeding and also to check out the car's registration. Casper 76, 1028, 1029. 
1028 Oregon Cash. Guy sees Barnett suddenly jump out of his car and reacts. I got something that Get might back help. in the car now. You, you wanted some paper? Get back in the car. This, this might help you. Get back. Barnett explains that he's just found his military driver's license and offers it to reassure the patrolman. What do you got? My military driver's license, sir. Well, that's not going to help. But it helps me Stay drive. in the car. Do not leave the car again. But, Thank you. Yes, sir. Scared. Okay, Billy, just sit still and be quiet. As Dai finishes writing the ticket, dispatch notifies him about the car and its occupants. Come in. Stolen vehicle. Occupants are considered armed and dangerous. Pick up and hold vehicle and occupants. 10-4. Copied. I'm on the bypass. I'm in route. Fellow patrolman Brad Ward also hears the dispatcher's report. He radios Dai, letting him know that he's just moments away. As his backup arrives, Dai moves his car away from the suspect. The suspect sees the second officer arriving and panics. Don't try to stop. No, they're not stopping us from going to Denver. They're not stopping us. Patrolman Ward watches and Barnett threatens. You're screwing everything up! You're screwing everything up! Oh, God! No! No! Drop the weapon! Drop the weapon or I'll kill you! Drop it! Get out on your belly now! Down! Down! Rick, Rick, you okay? Are you okay? Don't move or I'll kill you. Yeah, I'm all right. There's two other people in the car. What? She didn't have anything to do with it. I know. Barnett continues to insist that his wife was unaware of his prior activities. As twilight nears, Patrolman Dai takes no chances and keeps the suspect pinned to the ground until an ambulance arrives. I don't recall reacting. I, I did what I've been trained to do. I, I simply reacted the way I was trained to react. I don't remember to this day what drove me to do what I did. I just simply did it. When law enforcement goes after escapees, the dangers are high. Usually the criminals have nothing to lose. Sergeant Lanny Fields and Trooper Richard Rice of the Indiana State Police realize just how far desperate men are willing to go. It's just after sunrise on the morning of September 1st, 1978. Two men run through the woods of Putnamville, Indiana. Leslie Smith and Andrew Pine have just escaped from a state prison. Both are convicted felons with a long history of criminal activity. The men make their way to the side of the highway where a car is waiting. We go around here now. <laughs> Happy days. But even as they speed off, dispatches on the two suspects are filling the airwaves. Within minutes, Indiana State Trooper Richard Rice observes the suspect vehicle and starts his pursuit. Guys, get down. There's a cop back there. Man. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'm not going back. Putting the veil 5322. 5322. Behind the suspect vehicle is a maroon four door. Respawn on US 40 approaching State Road 241 South. As Rice continues his pursuit, Sergeant Lanny Fields is patrolling nearby and hears his colleague's dispatch. Fields heads towards Rice's location as backup. Meanwhile, Rice pulls the suspect vehicle over. Driver! Passenger! Show your hand! Man, I don't believe this. Passengers in the rear! Exit the vehicle to the rear! Yeah, right. Driver, exit be cool, the vehicle! Yeah. Be Go cool, now! Yeah. Driver, exit the vehicle. Turn around. Face the other direction. Do it now. As the suspects step out of their car, Trooper Fields arrives on the scene. 
The two officers cautiously approach the escapees and begin to handcuff them. Rice cuffs Pine and Fields attempts to cuff Smith. But Smith's wrists are extremely large and Fields is barely able to get the handcuff to the first notch on Smith's right hand. When Smith complains the handcuff is cutting his wrist, Fields takes him to his car to get his keys to adjust the handcuffs. The officer holds his suspect down with one arm and reaches for his keys with the other. As he adjusts Smith's handcuffs, the escapee makes his move. Drop the gun, pig! Drop it! Drew, get his gun! Ball game now, I ain't playing! Smith threatens to blow Fields' head off if Rice won't give up his gun. Seeing that the convict I'm is dealing. desperate, I'm Smith hands over his weapon playing. and removes Pine's handcuffs. Now both men are armed. Smith orders the, the two trunk. patrolmen into the trunk of Rice's car. He tries to close the trunk but cannot, succeeding only in slamming the metal onto the officers' heads. Smith's anger and desperation are clear. He is capable of anything, and the two patrolmen fear they're about to be killed. But at that moment, Trooper Charles Rairdon pulls onto the scene. Put the gun down! Drop the gun! Smith orders Rairdon to give his gun to Pine. But unknown to Smith or Pine, Rairdon has an off-duty 38 caliber revolver in the small of his back. And when the time comes, he makes his move. Put it down! Put it down! I got you now! Come on! Get over there! Get over there. Get over there. Down! Get over there. Now. With Pine secured, it's now Rairdon versus Smith. The officer screams at Smith to surrender. But the escapee screams back that if Rairdon doesn't drop his gun, he'll kill Patrolman Rice and Fields. Rairdon refuses to back down. And Smith, reaching a breaking point, reacts. He opens the trunk and points the 357 revolver at Fields' head. But in the split second before he fires, Fields manages to raise his arm between himself and the gun. This instinctive movement saves the officer's life, because when Smith fires, the bullet hits Fields in the arm instead of the head. Rairdon reacts by shooting Smith in the back. The lives of the two highway patrolmen are saved due to the resourcefulness of a fellow officer. Leslie Smith recovered from his wound and was convicted of escape, attempted kidnapping, and attempted murder. He is now serving a 70-year sentence in the Indiana State Penitentiary. Andrew Pine was convicted of escape and attempted kidnapping and is now serving a 42-year sentence in the Indiana State Penitentiary. When a dispatcher gives an officer a 211 call, it means that there's a robbery in progress. On July 31st, 1991, Officer Sterling Smith had just finished assisting at a traffic accident and was back on patrol near Bakersfield. What Officer Smith did not know at the time was that he had placed himself squarely in harm's way. On July 31st, 1991, a man enters a discount store in a shopping center in Oildale, near Bakersfield, California. He walks unnoticed through the store. A man checks to see if anyone is watching. Moments later, he makes his move. He draws a weapon and walks rapidly to the checkout counter. Before the startled employees and shoppers can react, he starts yelling, demanding all the money in the cash register. He tells the terrified cashier to put the money in a bag that he slams down on the counter. The woman complies, and the suspect runs out of the store with the money. An employee phones police as one of the witnesses goes after the robber. Call 911. I'm going to go after him. CHP officer Sterling Smith, who is on patrol nearby, hears the 211 call from CHP dispatch. Smith immediately drives to a spot where he can watch the robbers' possible escape routes. Where are you going? Let me in, let me in. Clutching the stolen loot, the suspect races to a car where an accomplice is waiting. But she panics and refuses to let him inside. Now the suspect is forced to flee on foot. 
The witness who chased the robber sees the patrol car and gives Smith a quick description of the suspect. Alerted by the radio call, a Bakersfield motor policeman is already en route to back up Officer Smith. Moments later, Smith spots the suspect running on a nearby road and advises CHP dispatch. Communications, I have a suspect in sight. He is running northbound foot bail towards the center, and the vehicle is going, I'll be in pursuit of the suspect. As CHP and motor officers close in, the suspect runs himself into a dead end, a chain link fence. In desperation, the armed robber tries to climb the barrier. The arriving officers shout at the suspect to drop his weapon. The suspect responds by aiming his gun at the officers, who are forced to fire in self-defense. As Officer Smith covers the suspect, the motor officer removes the handcuffs from his belt and secures the suspect. Officer Smith requests an ambulance while the other officer checks the suspect's vital signs. Later, paramedics transport the suspect to Memorial Hospital where he is pronounced dead on arrival. The suspect was later identified as 35-year-old Robert Eugene Purcell. At the time he attempted armed robbery, he was wanted for parole violation. He had 15 prior arrests with eight convictions, ranging from auto theft to kidnapping. <laughs>